Today on CityCast DC, Kava just went public to huge success in the market. District Taco announced this year that it wants to go national soon. Call Your Mother is going national already. So DC has so much success as an incubator for fast casual spots. Why is that? CityCast DC contributor Tim Ebner is here, as well as one of the co-founders of the Indian fast casual eatery, Rasa, to dig into it. It's Monday, July 3rd, 2023. I'm Bridget Todd, and here's what DC is talking about. So Tim, you've been reporting on DC's fast casual scene for a while. How would you define fast casual and why is it different from something like a McDonald's or a more traditional fast food restaurant? I think when people think of fast casual food, that word fast really is is a key part of it. It's it's a meal that's served quickly. And sometimes, you know, the line between what's fast casual and fast food is a little blurry, but I think that fast casual food typically is something that is a higher quality of food. So maybe it's locally sourced or farm fresh. It also is a type of concept where you can highlight a lot of things outside of, say, burgers and fries. You can do stuff like different cuisines from around the world. So I think there's sort of a different concept to fast casual in that there's a focus on quality ingredients, as well as I think what you see a lot of times is that the food is served in these to-go bowls so that you can take it quickly, you can go back to, say, your office or your home um, or eat it on the go um, in a way that's transportable. Um, and I think that the fast casual movement has really grown within the last five to 10 years, especially in a city like Washington, D.C. So I think we're seeing more and more of that um, happening here even as we've gone through um, the last two years of the pandemic, um, we still see fast casuals growing, um, which is great. And I think that there's definitely room for the future in Washington, D.C. So I was really surprised to learn that D.C. is kind of considered to be an incubator of fast casual dining. Um, at least that's how one listener put it to us in a voicemail. I'm wondering why you all think that D.C. has been such an incubator for fast casual food. What do you think it is about D.C. that allows for fast casuals to really thrive? Washington is obviously the nation's capital. It is a very affluent place with a lot of white collar sort of nine to five workers. I would say it's a very type A type city. So people are workaholics. Um, But I think that the fast casual market serves us well because a lot of times we're in a hurry to have lunch or to have dinner. And these are really easy, accessible, convenient ways to get food quickly and to eat quality food as well. So I really do think that the fast casual movement has a prominent role in this city because we have brands and companies like Sweet Green, Five Guys, Kava, and Pizza. And they really have used us as a test market space. And the great thing about D.C. is that, yes, we are an urban center, but there's also a lot of affluent suburbs around our region, places like Bethesda, Tyson's. And you see these companies experimenting and even testing to this day with their concepts in our market because they know that there are sort of these different types of neighborhoods and different types of audiences and consumers who are willing to try some of the new newer menu items or some of the newer concepted technologies that they're being put into these fast casual chains. What do you think it is about the fast casual that invites people to try new things that they might not ordinarily try or like, you know, even if you're not a big person like if you're not big on bowls, you might try a bowl from a fast casual other than like going to a sit down restaurant. Why do you think that is? I really feel like fast casuals give you the power of control over what you want put in that bowl or what you want put in your meal. There's so much to an experience when you walk into a fast casual restaurant where you actually walk the line and get to select the ingredients that are in front of you. So it gives you a little bit of a personalization, I think, which is really important. And also, you know, it's, I think, a chance or an opportunity to try something new. So a great example of this is every time I go to Kava, which is one of my favorite fast casuals, you know, they have like so many different toppings that you can put on top of, you know, a lamb kebab bowl or a chicken bowl. And so that gives you that opportunity to try maybe something new, whether it's feta cheese or, 
you know, Kamala with olives or banana peppers. Um, you can really get creative with it and kind of make it your own. So I think that's sort of the secret sauce to fast casuals is there is a level of personalization. Yeah, I, that's one of, one of my favorite things about the fast casual, where if you really just have to run out and grab lunch, you can order it ahead of time. And it does make it easier to just have a sad lunch at your desk. It makes me sad that we're known for this in D.C., but I know that we are. I can't agree more. And, you know, I think fortunately, fast casuals do focus you a little bit in slowing down in that you have a break. I actually like to wait in line for my meal because it's at least 10 or 15 minutes where I'm not in front of a computer or a screen and I can think about the food that I'm going to be eating for the lunch or for the dinner that I'm about to have. So there's definitely a variety of ways in which you can experience fast casual. But I agree that DC certainly has sort of this work-driven mentality. So I think that this is a concept very unique to our city. And I think it's why you're seeing so many different types of fast casuals beginning to emerge here in the city specifically. Yeah, I want to talk about one specific fast casual, uh, Taylor Gourmet. When I was working in an office that was our like go-to lunch spot, I remember when it was the controversy around like, were they Trumpers? There was like a protest there. I remember my office being like, we can no longer eat Taylor Gourmet. And it famously shut its doors a few years ago. What do you think Taylor Gourmet closing says about the model of the fast casual in D.C.? So Casey Patton, who was the founder and owner of Taylor Gourmet, he's actually a personal friend of mine and actually a neighbor as well. I think that Taylor Gourmet is an instance less about politics, actually, and and more about growing very quickly. And maybe a, a cautionary tale for other fast casuals in that It was a very popular sandwich chain, a a sandwich chain that I frequented a lot too and loved as well. But in its expansion, it was acquired by a private equity firm. And that growth really happened so quickly that the private equity basically had control over the operations of, of Taylor. So, you know, it's an interesting story and one to follow in that it's a story of growth. And I think Um, When fast casuals think about expanding, there's always this push of, do we get investors? Do we go public? And so there's this question of, you know, do you lose control over a fast casual once you start to put it into the hands of other people? And I think that is something that a lot of fast casuals have decided on their own, whether they stay sort of as an independently run business or they go sort of in an investment or publicly traded model. Um, So definitely something that's very interesting here. That's so interesting because, I don't know, I feel like in a city like D.C., the actual nuts and bolts of how businesses grow is perhaps the like less sexy story, but like the meat of the story, where it's like so easy to say, oh, well, this one thing contributed to its demise. You know, when it's like, actually, it's a story about intentional growth and what happens when growth happens too fast and things, you know, expand too quickly. Another key thing to be thinking about, too, is the business of fast casuals, right? They're much smaller spaces by footprint, and that's by design, but they also can do covers. And by covers, I mean they can do a single meal point of sale very quickly. The business of fast casual is not the business of running a restaurant. Um, Also, from a process perspective and, and building out your menu, you have to have things on the menu that are scalable and can be done by staff, not only in your store number one, but maybe in your store number 10 um, in another city. So you have to have menu processes too, um, where things can be uh, cooked efficiently and served efficiently in a way that gets the customer in and out of the door. So we asked some listeners to give us some voicemails about their favorite fast casual places. I'm Farabee. I live in Capitol Hill. And some of my favorite fast casual places are Little Sesame. The hummus there is just delicious and creamy and the toppings are really interesting and wonderful. I also really like Abunai Poke. That place has just really super fresh fish and the brown rice is really nutty and delicious. And then finally, an old favorite, District Taco. I think they do a great job with a broad variety of Mexican dishes. People talked about Little Sesame, District Taco, Sweet Green, but we also heard a little bit of critique for Call Your Mother. My fast casual hot take is that Call Your Mother is the most overrated place in all of D.C., It's not a Jewish deli. It's a Jewish deli-themed restaurant. They try way too hard and Bethesda bagels all the way. I wonder, Tim, what are your three favorite fast casual spots in D.C.? Or spots that you think people should try, should be on people's radars? 
Great question. And it's cool to see those callers um, with their own particular favorites. I think for my top three, so number one, Grazi Grazi is actually one of my top favorites. If you if you're a fan of Philadelphia style hoagies or Italian cold cut sandwiches, this is the place to go in Washington, D.C. It's really great sandwiches and the rolls are just baked fresh every day. So you're getting that quality sandwich. For something a little bit more from around the world, I would say head over to Rasa. And Rasa has two locations in D.C., one down at the Navy Yard, the other in Mount Vernon Square, as well as two locations in Virginia now. And they have a really cool veggie-driven concept. It's Indian-style cooking and cuisine. It's just such a cool experience. And for especially if you're vegetarian or you have a vegan diet, this is a great place to try out. And they have a kind of a growth trajectory here now, which is exciting to see. And then last but not least, I'd have to echo Little Sesame. Little Sesame to me is one of these chains that I hope grows to be more of a national presence, actually. Their hummus packages are found in grocery stores like Whole Foods, but they really do kind of Israeli-style hummus served fresh and warm in these hearty bowls with a a mixture of vegetables or meats and proteins. And so I think it's just a a really different concept. So I think they're one one to watch and one that will soon be on the rise. Oh my God, Little Sesame. I just had it for the first time recently. And at first I was like, hmm, hummus as a base. I don't know. And then afterward I was like, hummus as a base, hell yeah. (laughs) And you can't sleep on their dessert. They have tahini soft serve, which sounds crazy, but it's delicious and it comes in a cone. So I think when I'm going to Fast Casuals, I'm also judging them based upon their dessert offerings. And so that's really important for me as well. Oh, Tim, you're making me so excited for lunch. (laughs) I think that with Fast Casuals in Washington, you really just got to try as many as you can. There's a wide variety and I think a range of flavors from around the world, whether that's Mediterranean or Italian style cooking, Indian cuisine, um, you know, local and regional type food, whether it's lobster rolls at Luke's Lobster or cold cut sandwiches and pizzas um, and pizza being one of the largest, I think, on the growth fast casual chains from our region now. So I think that there's just so many options um, you can explore here and really um, try them all. Um, And it's fun to go to other cities and then see these places pop up and start to establish themselves more nationally. Um, And they're definitely a place where I think that there's growth potential for the future. So I'm excited to see what happens and see how fast casuals um, continue to grow in the years ahead. Thanks for being here, Tim. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. This episode is brought to you by FX's The Bear. The hit series returns with Jeremy Allen White in the Golden Globe winning role of Carmi. He and the team will transform their family sandwich shop into a next level spot, all while being forced to come together in new ways as they confront their past and reckon with who they want to be in the future. FX is the bear. All episodes now streaming only on Hulu. This episode is brought to you by Certified Piedmontese Beef. Listen up, foodies. Make your next meal even better with real Nebraska beef. They have healthy, tender, delicious Italian heritage beef, grass-fed and sustainably raised on lush pastures in the Midwest. You can even create your own personally curated meat box that's shipped right to your door. To get two free steaks with any purchase over $50, use the code FREEBEEF at checkout. Learn more and shop exclusively at cpbeef.com. So Tim mentioned Rasa as one of the newer fast casual spots in D.C., and we wanted to know what it's like to start up fresh here. So we went straight to the source. I'm here with Sahil Rahman, one of the co-founders of Rasa, and he's chatting with me from the restaurant itself. So Sahil, why did you decide on a fast casual as opposed to the sit-down model that I know your family was kind of known for? Uh, One of the main reasons why Sahil and I started Rasa was with the premise of how do we make Indian food more accessible? And our fathers, they owned a few Indian sit-down restaurants for the past 30 years. And in the early 90s, you know, that was met with a lot of skepticism or curiosity. People were like, I've never had that food before. Uh, I don't like curry. I hear everything is spicy and stuff like that. And we would bring our friends, sometimes drag them, kicking and screaming, to our father's restaurants. (laughs) They would try the food and they would leave almost evangelized. And so... 
We have seen Indian food come a really long way in the past 30 years in this country. When we set out to start Rasa, we actually interviewed over 400 people, actually, and asked them, okay, have you ever tried Indian food? Yes or no? 80, 90% of people were like, yeah, I have tried it, okay? Do you like in Indian food? Of those people who have tried it, over 90% were like, yeah, I really like it. Then third, how often do you eat it? And that's where we saw this big disconnect. Of it was once a month, a few times a year. And it's like, okay, you've tried it, you liked it, but you only eat it pretty rarely. And as we tried to dig into the issues there, that's what kind of made us come up with the fast casual model. Because one of the main reasons why people weren't going to eat Indian food as often was when they walked into the environment, if they didn't go with their Indian friend, it felt like a, a completely foreign atmosphere. There were Taj Mahal paintings on the wall. There's Indian music playing. And so if you've never been introduced to this cuisine or this culture, you feel almost intimidated or scared to walk in. With the fast casual model, we were able to kind of turn all these different barriers on their head by using this format. So it started with our location. We, we tried to pick places where people live and work. Then in terms of the ambiance and the decor, we've tried to make it a very welcoming and inclusive environment where if you were to walk in, you know, it just, it looks like a fast casual and it happens to be Indian in a certain sense. And then we, we chose for the service model to have the kind of the like line, build your own model, similar to a sweet green kava or chipotle, because we have an open kitchen. The guests can observe the chicken being grilled right behind the line. And then someone is cutting it and putting it right on the line. So that also, again, reduces the mystery behind the food. Is there something about DC that makes it prime for the kind of food experiences that you're trying to serve up with Rasa? For sure. Yeah. You know, you know, I think DC is a really unique place in that the demographic is well-traveled. You know, you have people coming from all sorts of places all across the world, honestly, because of the federal government being here, all the different related contractors and being the like center of the country. So you really get this population that has tried different cuisines from all across the world, people who are a little bit more affluent and have traveled. And so I, I think that's what really makes it a unique place for our concept of an Indian fast casual, but really just for fast casual in general. And we've seen a lot of similar brands who've all started in Washington, D.C., whether that's Sweet Green, Kava, and Pizza, they've all started here. Are there things about the fast casual model that allow you to, like, test out different things on the menu that you might not be able to do with a sit-down restaurant? For sure. I think it's a really easy way for us to test out new ingredients. And we also serve a large number of customers every single day maybe more than a traditional sit-down restaurant. And so that gives us just a, a really accessible audience to test something really fast. We try to change our menu seasonally. We add a few different chutneys or toppings, sometimes even a seasonal vegetable that, that we change. And so we'll be experimenting with something. We did a strawberry rhubarb chutney and a a few different other things. And because we have this kind of fast casual line model, we just added it onto the line. And while it wasn't on the menu, as people were, were going down and choosing their food, they were like, hey, what's that pink chutney? And our, our, our team was like, hey, we're actually just testing this strawberry chutney. Do you want to try some and let us know what you think? And doing that over the course of one week, it just gave us a ton of data like, okay, people are really enjoying this. Let's rolled out to all the restaurants. So it sounds like there are a lot of upsides to this model, but what were some of the difficulties in getting started with Rasa? Was it tough to fundraise? What did that process look like for you? I think the like hardest part of getting up and running was definitely part of the fundraising aspect. It actually took us almost two years. You pitch a, a number of people and then you get one bite and you're like on top of the moon and then you go two months without a single bite and you're like, man, is this restaurant going to ever happen. And so that was a, a, a really difficult time for us, um, especially because we were we were fairly young at the time. We were both like 24 years old. We set up a mini 
Rasa line on the dining tables and invited people and they were able to sample the food and see what the kind of model would actually look like and feel like. And I think having that was hugely helpful because then people understood like, oh, okay, like I saw you pitching it and I, I saw what it looks like on PowerPoint, but now I can actually taste what are the kinds of foods that you guys are putting together, the kinds of recipes and how everything kind of flows together. And so now as we kind of enter this pseudo post-COVID w- world, we're really just trying to figure out how we, how we, you know, get more people into our door and, you know, just um, help them find us and just c- continue to drive awareness. Well, I'll be looking forward to tasting what's next. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Rahul, thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much, Bridget. Truly an honor to be here. And uh, can't wait to have you over at our restaurant too. Oh, any day. (laughs) (laughs) And before you go, here's some quick news. DC's Department of Motor Vehicles is being forced to manually review 15 years of DUI and other traffic-related convictions to make sure they are actually placed on driver's records. The agency's outdated tech has been under scrutiny after a deadly crash revealed that the woman responsible shouldn't have had her license in the first place. Also, there are some big retail changes coming to D.C. The downtown H&M is closing its doors after 20 years of business. And in Columbia Heights, Burlington stores will be replacing the closing Bed Bath & Beyond. The new shop will go in right next to the just-opened Little Grocery Store. Finally, all metro and bus rides will be free tomorrow from 5 p.m. on. They're even bumping up the train frequency around the National Mall. So do yourself a favor and don't drive. That's all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, send it to your friends who are obsessed with the fast casual scene here. Our morning newsletter, Hey DC, also keeps track of new restaurant openings. Subscribe by texting DC to 66866. We're off for the 4th of July, but we'll be back on Wednesday. Talk to you then.